So I think when I was here in uh, 72, your dad had about 1,100 acres. He was farming with your uncle at that time, wasn't he? I think that's right. And But while they had 1,100 acres of crops, they were probably harvesting close to 2,000 with the double crop wheat and beans, right? Yeah, that has really turned out to be a wonderful rotation with the wheat and beans following the year of corn. And it just it breaks everything up and has done a good job. So you harvest three crops in uh, one year off this? Uh, three crops in two years. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, three crops in two years. And this no-tillage farming sign was put up in 1985, uh, donated by DuPont Ag Chemicals with the Kentucky Department of Transportation. And this is where no-tillage got its start in the whole world, right? I think that's right. We have had people here from a lot of different countries who believe that to be true, and I believe it to be true, simply because there was nowhere else in the world that it was done before then. In fact, the one gentleman I told you about earlier came in from Argentina. He looked at the sign, and he says, so this is where it started, is it? And he did a little obeisance like that just to show his uh, gratitude, because in Argentina, that particular farming enterprise, he said it has changed the way they live. So now today you and your son Al are uh, farming about 3,000 acres, which means you're harvesting about 4,500 acres. Right? That's right. And you're taking your sprayer and putting it across maybe 19 to 20,000 acres a year. Each acre of crop is sprayed several times, especially the wheat. We're in what I would call a modified intensive management schedule on wheat, in which we go over the wheat sometimes five, sometimes six times. So the sprayer is a very important part of our farming operation. You must uh, really be proud of the fact that your dad started this movement that's moved all the way around the world, particularly in South America and North America, but in a lot of other countries too. Yes, sir, I really am. And uh, it's a humbling thing to think that something this great for the environment, for the United States, for the world, and for the production of the food and fiber that we need actually started right here in, uh, in Christian County, Kentucky. Uh, I had a nephew who was studying in France once, and uh, of course his grandfather is the same as my father. And when he was studying there, they were talking about some brand new revolutionary tool that was now available to, to, to plant crops where they'd never been planted before. And this was about, oh, 2003 or 2004. And the more he heard about it, he says, I know, that's no-till. My grandfather did that. <laughs> and I told him, I said, Daniel, it just proves that sooner or later the French learn about everything. Right. They probably got him <laughs> to get up and teach the class. Huh? Well, anyway, yeah, I am very proud right. to, uh, to have my dad as my dad and the fact that no-tillage started right. right here. So along, along about 1962 when your dad started this, or 1965, how old were you then? I was 12 years old. Okay, what do you remember from those days? I remember junior high football and math class. Unfortunately, I don't remember much about the no-tillage movement that early, uh -huh. simply because I was too young to care. I, I regret saying that. I do remember that after that, there were a lot of phone calls, a lot of visitors, a lot of people who wanted to come by and talk, and really until I got interested in farming as a profession, uh, I didn't realize how great a thing it was, Frank. I just didn't understand how great a thing it was. I remember when I was here in 72, your dad talking, and they had estimated that 10,000 other farmers had been here uh, in, that, in the next, the last 10 years just to see what he was doing with no I have no doubt of that at all. There would be convoys of buses and people from different countries around the world, of course, different states within the United States. In 72, I was in college, so I probably was not here for that meeting, but there were a lot of lots and lots of visitors. So you got uh, 3,000 acres now. What's the future? You going to add more land, or you don't know, or what? Oh, I'm looking forward to more grandkids coming down the pike. There you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we hope to have a good, uh, sustainable, uh, profitable family farm here, well past when I'm gone. So, so that's that's my hope. So maybe you're going to tell Al, no more. We won't add any more acres till we get some more grandchildren. <laughs> Well, there's no challenges involved, there's no dares, <laughs> but uh, it's always good to see the family come back and enjoy being together yeah. as a family. That's great. What are about the two or three uh, key points that you've seen in no-till that's really helped this operation and helped other operations throughout the country and the world? Well, I think the one thing that are the strong points of no-till. There's got to be the, the primary focus. You save soil, you save labor, you save diesel. All of the savings that can go into the bottom line of a farming uh, operation, a profitable farming operation. Another thing would just be the, uh, the social changes that have taken place. I really believe no-till has been not only an environmental boost, but it's also been a boost to each American farmer who is still in business. 
By that I mean that I think it has ex it has sped up the the um, procedure in going from many 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 small farms to fewer and fewer larger farms, which unfortunately uh, for the small farmer uh, is difficult, but is also much more efficient. In other words, if you had to have the number of tractors that it would take to plow and to disc and to prepare, you would have to have far more workers, and those workers are now doing other things in other professions, and I think the, the sociological implications are quite great. I've been following no-till since 1972, and I understand the importance of the conservation benefits to this, but I've always said from day one the economics had to be there. To Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, every farmer must make a profit. It's as simple as that. No-till, I believe, adds to the possibility of each farmer making a profit simply because it, it saves him in so many ways and it also produces just as much, if not more, than the conventional farming method. So you're exactly right. We used well, for, for a number of years we heard people say, well, I'm not so sure I want to no-till. I think I'm going to lose some yield because of this. I think that's true up to a point. For the first year or two after you move into a farm that has been plowed and ripped and disked, there is a, a lack of um, earthworm channels and root channels and all of the things that add to the structure and the strength of a soil. So a no-tiller has to be patient because after that first year or two, then you're going to start seeing some benefits. And those are the things that are really the long-term advantage to no-till, right. the environmental benefits. I think that's uh, very important that these people who no-till stick with it, and uh, both on corn and soybeans and other crops, you can't be jumping back to a, like a minimum tillage on one and then come back and expect to get all the benefits of no-till. Yeah, the ideal world would be to have nothing disturbed but the place where the seed goes in the ground. Right. And we're not there yet, but we're getting closer and closer each year. Thank you. All right, Al, I was, I was an old geezer then, and I still am, and I can remember when this sign went up. Do you have memories of when this sign went in? You know, just barely, Dad. I was, I guess, four years old, or maybe not quite four yeah, at the time. about that. So That's about that right. October, I would have turned four, and just, I can remember a crowd of people, but what I remember better is when Granddaddy would speak to busloads of people from Argentina and different countries that would come through, would set up in the backyard under the shade tree, and I remember that very clearly when he would deal with that. We had refreshments too, didn't we? I don't know if I ever got any of those. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe those were for the adults. I, think I, don't I wasn't know. <laughs> yeah, encouraged to have sugar. But What do you think about farming yeah. now? You know, I'm really glad. Um, just a little background here for you guys is I've been back on the farm full time now for going on to five years. Yeah. So it, did a bachelor's and master's degree and moving in full-time, renting land and trying to diversify what we've got with irrigation and that kind of thing. And it's a very exciting time for me to be back farming with you and just stepping into the sixth generation there in the family process. There's a lot of people that would love to be where I am and there's a lot more that don't understand what we are doing. Yeah. And it's really exciting for me to be here. Well, it may be exciting for you, but it's equally exciting for Beth and for me. We are delighted to have you back. Thank you. That's <laughs> great. Well, I know for sure, after having worked with Al for five years now, that I don't know it all. <laughs> that uh, he has a, a skill package that is beyond mine in some areas, and I have a skill package that maybe cut the corner and did an end run on him at some time. But we can play off each other's strengths, and I think it has made it a stronger business having both of us here. Yeah, I think that, you know, so far, Dad and I work really well together. He's very patient and has a lot of years of knowledge and experience. But all kidding aside, you know, I see other buddies of mine that are my age and trying to do the same thing who just do not work well with the person that's already in position, whether it's their father or an older business partner who's their sponsor or whatever. There are some real issues that, you know, Dad and I have not had to overcome. And, you know, same thing. I don't know it all, too. And I have learned a lot more than I did in my college classes just from working with Dad for these few years. You all talked about the four Ps earlier, and I guess that's the two Ps, the pride and the pressure. <laughs> and if they can balance out to a successful farm, then I think that's good. Well, but, the, the common denominator that we have is my wife, obviously. You know, she keeps things running smoothly. She is good at that, or we wouldn't be getting along so well. So give credit where credit is due. My wife, Beth, too. Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. Mom and Dad both. Yeah.